All right, so um, I will start by writing out the method. Just uh, put it in, put it out there. Proposition 3.10.3. All right, this is method. to express dy dx in terms of x alone. All right, so this in a nutshell is the method. All right. So, um, See here, I'll show you uh, inverse inverse cosine. All right, so I start by writing y equal to that. I take cosine of both sides. I've got cosine of y. Step two, I need to differentiate implicitly with respect to x, right? So what's the derivative of cosine y? We got uh, minus sine of y dy dx equal to 1, right? Are you still back over there? Yeah. And, uh, to yeah, it's fine. I'll take a drink. I know I was in the way of the writing half the time, right? Yeah, we just got rid of that. There's a mess of right the there, there's, there's a mess of chords in the corner there that makes it unwise for me to stand there. Remember, sine squared plus cosine squared is what? That's why it's one, right? So that means. 
think that sine squared y is 1 minus cosine squared y, right? Which in this context is 1 minus x squared, right? Because cosine y is x. So what's that say? That says sine y could be plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. So I think at this point, I need to take a little, a little detour and prove a little theorem for you. All right. Um, in fact, I need to kind of, um, it's a little bit more than a detour, but we're, we're, so we're, we're a little bit at the moment at a loss on how to choose plus or minus here, right? Because we could choose either one algebraically, which one is the right choice? inverse derivative of inverse cosine. So I want, I want to point some things out to you. A little, a little detour on increasing and decreasing. Right? So here's an example of an increasing function. Here's an example of a decreasing. Sorry. Here's an example of a decreasing function. Increasing Increasing, decreasing. So you guys tell me, what can you say about the derivative of an increasing function? What's the slope of tangent lines? If I, if I draw little tangent lines here, do you, do you, what's the slope of those tangent lines? Well, m is positive, right? Slope of tangent lines over here, m is negative, right? So in other words, if f prime of x is greater than 0 for all x, some, some interval u, then f is increasing on u. On the other hand, if f prime of x is less than 0 for all x in some interval u, then f is decreasing on u. Now, these things I prove more carefully and systematically in chapter 5, all right? because to prove these things carefully, we'd have to talk about the mean value theorem and a few other theoretical results in calculus. But this is what we'll learn. We'll learn that where the derivative is positive, the function's increasing. Where the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. If the derivative is zero, that's a place where it could have a turning point. So it's like a min or a max looking forward. Question? Yeah, that almost looks stupid here, but can you give me an explanation of the symbols that the u and a like? u and a. Well, not, not an a, but upside down a camera. Oh, no, that's not a stupid question at all. That's a shorthand. That's an abbreviation. If you don't understand, you should ask about it. That's great. This means for all. For all. For all. So what that means, this mean for all x, and this, this is literally led, this literally means for all elements inside you. And in this case, I could cross out the word elements and say perhaps points would be a better word. You know, um, the real numbers inside this subset you. So, right. yeah. Um, in fact, it's okay if it's less than or equal to zero. I don't know. No, I'd be careful. All right, so my point to you, positive, increasing, negative, decreasing, right? So what does this have to do with our current discussion? Well, how are f and the inverse of f related? What, what formula do we have? F of F inverse of X is equal to Y. By definition, they're inverse functions, right? So that's equal to X again. What happens when we differentiate this formula? Differentiate this formula, what do you get? You've got DF dx at f inverse of x, right, times, this is the chain rule, the derivative of the inverse function of x with respect to x. And what's that equal to? 
Well, that's equal to the derivative of x with respect to x, which is 1, right? So what, is, what does this say? What does this say? When the product of two things is equal to 1, what does that tell you about the signs? Think about it. It must either be the case that the derivative of the function is positive, and the derivative of the inverse function is positive, right? Or it must be the case that they're both negative. We can't have one positive and one negative. So the sign, see the sign of the function and the inverse function, they must match. Right? So cosine, inverse cosine, it's the inverse of what function? Do you guys remember? It's the inverse of cosine restricted to a particular region. See, cosine inverse is inverse or cosine restricted 0 pi by definition. Right? That's why when we take inverse cosine, we get values from 0 pi. That's the range of inverse cosine. So you look at that. Is cosine decreasing or increasing on that interval? You can see it. Decreasing, right? So this implies we choose the minus. We choose the minus because that's going to make the formula for the derivative of inverse cosine negative. And hence, we find dy dx equal to um, minus. Oh, my bad. My bad. Should we choose the minus? My bad. Look at this. Let's take, let me, let me just take a second here. Plug this up in here. What do you get? Minus 1 over plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. So do I, do I actually choose the minus? I forgot. There's another minus already there from the derivative of cosine itself, right? So if I want this, if I want dy dx, the derivative of the inverse function, to be negative, I actually have to choose the plus here because that gives me an overall minus. In other words, the formula has to be minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So there it is. Sorry, all this fuss over just whether to choose our plus or a minus, but you know we have to, we have to, you know, think about it. Now, many students don't think about it. They just say, uh, "Well, it's a square equal to something else, so the answer is square root," because they don't ever think about the minus, you know. So it's it's easy to not even think through this for many folks. Um, but anyway, I'm not trying to hide things from you. This was not an issue last class, right? Because um, we did inverse tangent, right? And there was we didn't we didn't face a square root in this in the simplification algebra. So, like the uh, little two minute example I did the last class was easier in that regard. All right, I think the best thing to do is to do another example. sign, should it work out to a positive or a negative? Positive, that's right. So, helping you out there a little bit on the kind of the tricky nuance part of that one. All right, here we go. In class example, we're on page 14. 
2.1045. All right, so we're going to let um, y equal to the natural log of x. We want to find the derivative of the natural log. Right? Okay, so what's the inverse function of natural log? It is the exponential. So e to the y equals e to the ln of x, but e to the ln of x, of course, is just x again. Now, we differentiate implicitly. So, d dx of e to the y equals to dx e dx of x, right? This gives us e to the y times dy dx equals to 1. So we solve for dy dx, right? And that gives us 1 over e to the y. But what is e, e to the y is equal to what? e to the y is equal to x, right? So that's 1 over x. So therefore, ddx of the natural log of x equals to And here, our, our assumption, of course, is that x is greater than 0, right? Does that make sense? You, you see the, we're doing the same kind of system of steps every example here. Uh, in class example 3.10.6 is a homework problem. Uh, in class example 3.10.7, we did last class. It's inverse tangent. Um, let's see here. I'll revisit a to the x again. What else do I want to do? Uh, let's see here. Let me do a hyperbolic one. Let's do ddx of inverse hyperbolic cosine of x. Let's see if that works out. Yeah. So, um, by the way, hyperbolic cosine looks like this. And it is the inverse hyperbolic cosine. It's the inverse with respect to this part. So, increasing, we expect positive derivative, okay? All right, so let us go through the steps. We say y equals the Koch inverse of x. And that gives us cosh of y equals to x. Differentiate implicitly, we get cinch of y dy dx equals to 1. Solve for dy dx, we get 1 over cinch y. But remember, cosh squared y minus cinch squared y equals to 1. So we can solve that for cinch y, cinch squared, cinch squared, you get cinch squared y equals to cos squared y minus 1, which gives me that cinch of y is plus or minus the square root of, well, cos y was what? Cos of y was x, right? So this cos squared is really x squared. Right? So, Okay, great, so that's one over, and what am I gonna choose, the plus or the minus? Well, I want an increasing, you know, I want a positive derivative, so I'm gonna choose the plus. Because unlike the uh, inverse cosine problem, there's no minus upstairs to fight against. And there you go. The derivative with respect to x of inverse hyperbolic cosine of x is equal to 1 over the square root of x squared minus 1. It's kind of neat to write that right next to the, let me, let me rewrite the, uh, re rewrite the inverse cosine, right? Compare and contrast. What's the difference? 
they're always kind of similar, right? But there's always a slight difference. You see the difference. x squared minus 1 versus 1 minus x squared. It's a pretty, pretty big difference, right? I'll do one more of these, okay, guys? <clears throat> and then I'm hoping that the ones you do in the homework, you know, help kind of round it out. I'll do example 3.10.8. Uh, this looks kind of tricky. Here we're supposed to calculate, um, you know, the derivative of the secant inverse. All right. All right. So we say y equals to in, uh, inverse secant of x. We say secant. Okay. So secant of y is equal to x. What's the derivative of secant? Derivative of secant, we worked this out before. It is secant times tangent. So we have secant y, tangent y, but we're differentiating with respect to x, so we have to multiply by dy dx, remember, this is an implicit differentiation. And that's equal to dx dx, which of course is equal to 1. So we solve for dy dx. And we get 1 over secant y tangent y. Now, secant y is equal to x, right? So, okay, so that, that that gets, that gets this, right? That, that's that's going to make that nice. But what about tangent? We don't want to leave our answer as tangent y. How are tangent and secant related? Do you remember? The identity is that um, tangent squared y plus 1 is equal to secant squared y. Now, in this case, secant squared y is actually equal to x squared, right? So solve that for tangent. What do you got? You got tangent squared equals x squared minus 1, right? And tangent y, then, is equal to the square root of x squared minus 1. But I to be careful, of course, there has to be a plus or minus, right? Technically. The question then is inverse secant, um, you know, what's the deal with inverse secant? Where where is um, wh wh where is inverse secant defined for? I don't think I've ever talked about this with you guys. How can we figure it out? Here's how I would figure it out. The range of inverse secant, right, would be equal to the domain of the part of secant which it's the inverse for. So I can try some things if I can if I have a secant inverse. Oh shnikes, I don't have a secant inverse on my calculator. So we're up a creek. <laughs> oh well. Um, yeah. Oh, here. Let me, uh, let me, let me, let me fall prey to my baser instincts. What's the domain of inverse secant? Oh, I didn't want the domain. Oh, varsity tutors. Well, varsity tutors, obviously. So the range is, oh, it's horrible. What's the range of inverse secant? Minus pi 2. According to some information, minus I found pi 2 is making sense. 
minus pi 2. <laughs> oh, Wikipedia, where are you when I need you? All these stupid tutoring sites, I just want the Wikipedia. You know? All right, well, anyway. Hey, wait a minute, I wrote notes, didn't I? Why not let me get my notes? Dummy. Me, not you guys. Oh, I just took the positive square root in the notes and dodged the question. Ah, uh, punk. Well, anyway, apparently it's positive. So it must be that if we could dig into it and see which part of the secant it's the inverse for, it would be increasing. So, which is positive. I admit I haven't entirely explained that at the moment, but um, let's see here. So we have um, derivative with respect to x of inverse secant of x equals to 1 over secant, secant y of x and tangent y is square root of x squared minus 1. So there you go. Now guys, like if this kind of thing came up on the test and if you just left it as plus minus, I would give you like most of the credit, if not all, you know. How do you know which one to choose? <laughs> it depends, well, it depends on whether the function is positive, is increasing or decreasing. Um, you know, where the inverse is the inverse for the function. Um, so apparently, for secant, secant's increasing. Now, secant is one over you know one over cosine x, right? So basically. My suspicion, so 1 over cosine x basically looks like this, between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. And if I had to guess, if I had to guess, I would say that this part of the secant is the part for which inverse secant is the inverse function. So the secant's increasing there. I'm pretty sure that's the case. Like the definition of inverse secant is it's the inverse secant the inverse function for secant restricted to 0 to pi over 2, not included. Um, since secant's periodic, like the inverse function has to be defined for a restriction. You can't define the inverse for the whole thing because you violate the horizontal line rule. And, and you can't, you know. All of these inverse functions, they're inverses for a function restricted to a particular interval. Like sine inverse is not the inverse for the whole of sine. It's the inverse for sine restricted to minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Inverse tangent. It's not the inverse for the whole of tangent, it's the inverse for the tangent restricted minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Inverse cosine is not the inverse for the whole of cosine on the real line, it's the inverse for cosine restricted to 0 pi. Um, inverse hyperbolic cosine is not the inverse for the hyperbolic cosine on the whole of the reals, it's the inverse for the hyperbolic cosine from 0 to, zero to infinity. And so like it varies. Inverse hyperbolic sine, on the other hand, is the inverse for cinch on the whole of the reals because Inverse hyperbolic, I mean, excuse me, cinch. Cinch looks like this, right? Like cinch is always increasing, so it passes the horizontal line test on its whole domain. So it has a global inverse. There, there's the example one. But anyway, sorry guys. Oh, well, there is one more example I have to cover. Um, what is the derivative with respect to x of log? base a of x, that actually matters. We should talk about that a bit. Right? We've talked about the derivative of um, a to the x, right? So log base a is the inverse function. The inverse function for <coughs> a to the x. Are we still assuming from the last example that x is greater than 0? Ah, uh, yes. Very good. We should, assume, we should assume that. If we have x less than 0, we either need to put absolute value in the argument or replace x with minus x. We'll get back to that in about a month or so. So that comes up in the integration. It's a good question. Now, here, so we say y is equal to log base a of x. Now here I'm assuming that a is, by the way, greater than zero, and we're also assuming a is not equal to one, because 
a equals to 1 is not an interesting base. What does 1 to the x look like? By the way, what does x is 1, right? So in the world of exponential functions, it's really not a very good answer. It's not a very interesting case, you know? Uh, on the other hand, things like this, it's y equals 2 to the x. I wonder where I was. Ooh, my bad. Oh no. Well, all right, well, it is where it is. Sorry. Sorry to the missing. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, this guy would be y equals one half to the x, right? Or you could write it as 2 to the minus x. But my point to you is. 1 to the x, we don't really think of as an exponential function. So any, any positive base is an exponential function. The base is less than 1 half, they're actually like reciprocal. And so they look different. But the um, bases larger than 1 are what I, what I canonically think of as exponential functions, honestly. But technically speaking, 1 half to the x is also an exponential function. All right, so great. So we take a to both sides, a to the y equals a to the log base a of x, but a to the log base a of x is x again. And what did we, what did we work out the last time? We had, okay, so dx of a to the y equals dx dx, right? What was the derivative of a to the y? solve for dy dx. No pesky square root or anything like that here. This one's nice. Log a times a to the y, but of course a to the y is equal to x. So what do we have? We've got 1 over x log a. In other words, d dx of log base a of x is equal to 1 over x times natural log of a. There you go. So that's how that goes. What happens when we put a equals to e? Then we have ddx. Remember log base e of x is the natural log of x. So that gives us the derivative of the natural log of x equal to 1 over x because the natural log of e is 1. So that formula drops back to the one we proved earlier today in that context. All right. Our next topic is called logarithmic differentiation. And it's, it is very much connected to what we're currently doing. All right. But it is yet another technique. So the basic idea of logarithmic differentiation is given complicated expression. 
take the natural log of it and differentiate that. Basically, implicitly, you get an answer. Now, I'll try to expand on this, but um, and um, the the beautiful thing about this this and that's a very crude explanation of what it is. You'll see it in the examples. Okay. Um, the, the 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 beauty of this method is we get to use the properties of logarithms to aid the differentiation. All right. So let me show you an example. And usually the complicated expression we call y. All right, so example one. Suppose we have y is the square root x cubed plus 1 times e to the x squared divided by the cube root of uh, 1 plus 2x. I think we can all agree we do not want to differentiate this directly, right? It's a pain. See what happens when we take the natural log of this natural log of y, right, is the natural log of the cube, the square root of x squared plus 1, that's cubed plus 1, plus the natural log of e to the x squared. And how does logs work? How do logs work? If I have, let me just write a pattern. If I have log of a, b over c, the pattern says log a plus log b minus log c. Remember, we subtract it for the denominator. So I do minus the natural log of the cube root of 1 plus 2x. All right? But remember what these mean. This is natural log of x cubed plus 1 to the 1 half power. What's the natural log of e to the x squared? Let's put that out as the misery. They're inverse functions. This is x squared. And then I have minus the natural log of what? 1 plus 2x to the what power? To the 1 third power, right? Remember the other property of logs? The power property? Natural log of a to the p power is p log a. Remember that's a property of logs? We can pull powers out. So that to the 1 half power becomes 1 half natural log of x cubed plus 1, right? Plus x squared uh, minus 1 third natural log of 1 plus 2x. Uh, have I not been over here again? <sighs> I am the worst. So sorry, guys. I mean, I'm not sorry to you guys. <laughs> you see what I did. So you're like, well, this does not give me joy. You're begging a part of algebra that I thought I could forget about, right? Well, it's time to remember it. All right, we need it here. But really, there are three key properties that when we have a product of things, we add the logs. Like the log of a product is a log of the sums, right? And when we divide by something, we subtract the log. And three, if we have log of a, something to a power, it's the power times the log. Now, you've got to be careful. It has to be the whole expression, right? Like, if I have log of a, b squared, like this, this is not equal to 2 log a, b. I cannot do that. What I have to do is log a plus log b squared, which is then log a plus 2 log b. So the 2 only power pulls out from the thing that's the power of 2. Be careful not to try to pull power out of where it's not, right? If I had, if I had log of a b quantity squared, that would be equal to this. But that's different. All right. Okay, so let us go on with this example. Look what we have. We have natural log of y 
equals to all of this, right? Now, I would point out to you, if we're differentiating with respect to x, the natural log of, let's say, u, how does that work? What's the rule for differentiating natural log? We do 1 over u from earlier today, right? The derivative of the natural log is 1 over whatever's inside it. But then we're differentiating with respect to x, so I have to multiply by du dx, all right? So I am going to use this extensively in this example and the ones that follow. This is how we differentiate natural log. All right, so we're just going to do that. We're going to do that. Let's put it into practice. So here we go. We've got natural log of y, I'll write it down again, equals to, what is it, 1 half natural log of x cubed plus 1 plus x squared minus 1 third natural log of 1 plus 2x, right? So we differentiate. differentiating log y. Alright? We get 1 half 1 over x cubed plus 1. Right? And by the way, guys, I prefer to write this as du dx on the numerator divided by u. Like that's that's the convenient way to write the formula. So I write the derivative in the numerator and I divide by u. Like that's the, the nice way to write this formula. So as I differentiate this x cubed, natural log of x cubed plus 1, I'm going to write 3x squared, because that's the derivative of the inside function, and I divide by that inside function. Right. Again, I'm using the box formula. And what's the derivative of x squared? Well, that, you guys know that, right? 2x, right? And then we get minus one third, parentheses. What's the derivative of the inside function this time? Yeah. Two divided by one plus two x. Right. So then solve for dy dx. After all, that's what we're after. Sometimes I'll say you can use y in your answer in the instructions to a problem. If I say that, you could use this as the answer, right? But we can do a little bit better, right? We can put back y to what it was, which in this case is the cube root of, oh, excuse me, square root of x squared plus 1, x cubed plus 1, if I could write my own thing, um, times e to the x squared divided by the cube root of 1 plus 2x, yeah, times um, uh, 1 half times 3x squared over x cubed plus 1 plus 2x minus um, 1 third 2 over 1 plus 2x. And um, so there it is. This is the technique of logarithmic differentiation. It allows us, when we're faced with a derivative that involves products and quotients, to take them and reduce them to sum and difference, and also to pull powers out to, because of the property of the log. Then we can differentiate, and it's actually pretty easy.
Let me show you a less complicated example. This one will go a little bit quicker. See how it works with logarithmic differentiation. So we go natural log of y, and I'm just going to do it in one. I'm just going to do it in one step. You can also, if you understand. Now, if you need to break it down into multiple steps, like I did in the first example, then do so. Right? But I'd like to point out that you don't have to do that. I mean, this is a natural log of x plus one plus b natural log of x squared plus two plus c natural log of x cubed plus 3, if I take the log of the expression. Here I'm assuming a, b, c are, po uh, are constants. Not necessarily positive, but a, b, c constants. All right. Now we differentiate implicitly. So then we can solve for dy dx, right? So that implies that dy dx is equal to y, but I'll write, I'll write out the y as y is x plus 1 to the a times x squared plus 2 to the b plus x, oh, excuse me, not plus times, x cubed plus 3 to the c, all times a over x plus 1. Qbx over x squared plus 2 plus 3 cx squared over x squared plus x cubed plus 3. And that's the derivative. The time it takes to do that is very, very much on par with the time it takes to write out and carefully execute the triple product rule. This technique is a contender for how you should differentiate such expressions. Once you get beyond three things, once you got four things, or you got division, logarithmic differentiation beats it, beats the other method. Logarithmic will beat using the quotient rule hands down. Now it comes, it comes with a cost, which is you have to have positive expressions. And if you don't have positive expressions, well then you gotta play some tricks. And I don't wanna talk about those. <laughs> um, anyway, look, if you start looking at this, you can imagine multiplying this out you know, and you can start seeing the triple product rule, right? Like this times that gives you an x plus one to the a minus one power, right? With an a, right? Because if you differentiate, you know, x plus one to the a power, what do you get? You get a times x plus one to the a minus one, right? And you can, you can see this, if you think about multiplying this, times that, right? It's there. So, I mean, anyway, you, you can, if you multiply this out, you get back to the triple product rule is my point. All right. Okay, so logarithmic, different, logarithmic differentiation is very helpful for ugly products and divisions 
And I've given you a couple of these kind of problems to work in your homework. But I've also given you another kind of problem. There exist examples that you need the techniques of logarithmic differentiation to actually calculate the derivative. Or you need some kind of, uh, um, well, actually it's a calculus three technique, right? So I don't really want to teach you a calculus three technique in calculus one, do I? I mean, that would be, that would be kind of, that wouldn't be very friendly. So we don't do that. Um, but, but there is a calculus three way to do this too, that's true. So here's example three. What if you face differentiating something that just doesn't fit the rules, like this, x to the e to the x cosine x. This function, it's neither a power function nor an exponential function, because it had variables both in the base and in the exponent. So we can't use the power rule, and we can't use the exponential one either. It's something else. But what we can do is give it a name. Y. Like that. And once we do that, we can take the natural log of it. Right? And we can use properties of log simplify that. Like so, yeah. Am I not over here again? Oh man. You know, I am I am very bad at camera work today. dy dx is equal to x to the e to the x cosine x, that's my y, times this stuff, which is what? I've got e to the x cosine x log x is my first term, because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. What's the derivative of cosine? Well, minus sine, right? minus e to the x sine x log x. What's the derivative of log x? Derivative of log x is 1 over x, we learned today. So I get plus 1 over x times e to the x cosine x. And there you go. This is the derivative of this pesky, pesky function. differentiate something like x to the something involving x, but you use logarithmic differentiation that'll that'll cure what ails you. Do, 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 do. There are more examples in the homework, right? So I'd encourage you to look at those. Ah, something I should talk about in class, lest I forget. Um, the power rule, right? We should revisit the power rule now that we have a little bit more technology. What is the power rule? Was what? dx of x to the n equals to n x to the what? Yeah? n minus what? n minus 1. n minus 1, very good. And when is this true? This is true for n in the real number. If you examine the arguments I gave you early in the course, you'll notice that I only proved it for like natural numbers. 
or maybe integers, or maybe fractions at best, right? But this is true for real numbers. Let's see why. So we have a y equal x to the n. We're going to assume x is positive just to keep things simple, right? Then what? Well, natural log of y is natural log of x to the n, which is n log x, right? Differentiate both sides. We get 1 over y dy dx equals n over x, which then implies that dy dx is equal to n y over x, right? But that's equal to n x to the n divided by x, which is equal to n x to the n minus 1. And this calculation does not presuppose that n is a natural number or, an, or, or a rational number. This calculation works for any real n. So, you know, now that we are a little bit further down the road, we can actually prove this and here it is. For example, if you had dx of x to the pi, you know, it is pi x to the pi minus So I would remind you, on page 120, I have a master list of all the derivatives that we're supposed to like know. Um, maybe that's too strong. Well, it would be good if you, I, I have these memorized personally. It would be good for you to have these memorized up as well. Um, there's a few in here who are a little, a little lower priority than others. So here's the list I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, this one. log x, um, sine, cosine, tangent, secant, um, inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. Um, these are higher priority than the rest of the ones on here, for example. But of course, square root of x is high priority. That's, that's true. All right. And then um, I also have this you know, summary. Here's our basic rules. What have we learned? We have a sum rule. We have a product rule. We have a quotient rule. We have a chain rule. And now we also have implicit differentiation in the log, log technique, although that doesn't appear in my summary. All right, so that brings us to the next topic, which is related rates. And um, so guys, if you need to see more examples of log differentiation like tomorrow, I'll do them. But I wanted to at least talk to you guys a little bit about related rates today, uh, just to try to, you know, maybe demystify the homework a bit. I'll try to work two examples, one easy, one hard. Related rates is just what it sounds like. Right? So here's an example. If air flows into balloon, cubic centimeters per uh, minute when the radius is equal to 10 centimeters, then how fast is volume of this spherical balloon increasing? So you got this kind of 